Hi everyone, my name is Teodor Mitev and in this lecture titled Anonymous Resistance, Hackers, Laws and Whistleblowers I want to discuss the emergence of the hacker subculture uh, in conjunction with the emergence of the internet, uh, internet and the rise of uh, cyber culture as a phenomenon. So, uh, in this lecture, as usual, I'll start with a brief discussion of uh, uh, the key tropes um, that uh, link the lecture to uh, the rest of the series. Um, and then I will um, briefly discuss uh, the, the you know, first hackers and the, the, the emergence of the hacking subculture uh, in the uh, early 80s. And, uh, and then I'll briefly touch on, on a number of uh, uh, examples of uh, hacktivism. Uh, from uh, the 90s and the 2000s. All right, so let's start with the key tropes that position us within the frame of uh, uh, our discussion uh, of uh, the network society, the network society paradigm and cyber culture in this cycle of lectures. So as a reminder, the network society is characterized by a social structure made of uh, information networks it is an always already global bioelectronic environment. Uh, its key fundamental resource is knowledge. Its fundamental uh, um, unit of value, if you will, is information. Uh, it operates on a binary logic of inclusion and exclusion because if you are not on the network, literally you do not exist from the perspective of the network. And its uh, strategic space uh, the space where battles are waged is people's minds, right? It's strategic space is people's perception and attention. Uh, the new economy that emerges with the rise of the network society is uh, uh, obviously logically characterized by knowledge work, by information work. Uh, it's uh, uh, based on uh, the flow of uh, 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 information globally. Um, its operations are always already decentralized, right? So these are decentralized networks. So if you, you could think of uh, uh, non-governmental organizations or of uh, corporations for that matter, they're always already decentralized uh, uh, with operations spanning the globe. And the primary uh, uh, value proposition here is in uh, connectivity and in sorting information, in, in finding uh, 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 information, the correct information for the correct purposes, and actionable knowledge, as we already described. The kind of uh, effects this has on life and on the experience of being in the network society paradigm, uh, we described as uh, obliteration of uh, uh, borders, and by borders we understand uh, uh, individual, family, state, or geographical borders. Uh, uh, the, the, there is a homogenization of time and the experience of time and the experience of space, right? Everywhere uh, things become more or less uh, the same looking and are experienced in the same way. Um, there is, there is a, a proliferation of personal information spaces and we nowadays carry uh, one of, of uh, the, the portal to these personal information spaces in our pockets, right? In the form of smartphones which are actually very powerful computers. Uh, uh, we ex all experience presence bleed because of the separation between the here and the network. Uh, and you might be technically in a, a locale, in a specific uh, uh, grounded space, but uh, uh, your attention, your mind is somewhere else. It is in the network. Hence, you experience a presence bleed. The, the, uh, uh, it's the primary work experience is this chronic task of sorting information, which has to be permanent 24-7, uh, which leads to a precarious existence and the experience of flux as, as, uh, uh, as the primary existential feeling. The, we described the key uh, uh, corporate form of or, uh, organization uh, 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 distinct for the network society paradigm as the stack, the information stack, which uh, is formed by vertically integrated walled gardens of content and information with uh, hundreds of millions of users, with often with its own uh, proprietary operating system, its own uh, server farms, um, with, uh, often with its own mobile device ecology, definitely with its own app, its own 
uh, software portal, if you will, uh, often with its own currency or, or its own units of valorization, which act as quasi-currency. Uh, the main product of the stack are its users, the behavioral patterns that can be extracted from the user's attention. Um, and these behavioral patterns in turn are what uh, 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 is used by the stack to uh, participate in and valorize uh, in, in uh, uh, behavioral futures markets where predictions uh, uh, can be made about uh, uh, the uh, behavior of, of, of vast segments of the population and more importantly that behavior of vast segments of the population can be modulated based on uh, those predictive patterns. Um, we also talked about the network society as a political space and, uh, and again, we picked up on this trope that the key space is people's minds. And there is, uh, 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 again, be because of the, the very nature, the topology of the network, of the space over which this phenomenon unfold, uh, uh, the, the, the key political uh, form that uh, uh, operations take is, is uh, uh, decentralized or often distributed right so again think in terms of uh, the role of non-governmental organizations globally which often act in a very decentralized manner right um uh, or the role of corporations for that matter uh these uh, political uh, the, the political space is unrestrained by borders right and it uh, leads to information flows uh, spanning the globe and global participants in here to follow local events, right? Think in terms of elections or protests, etc., etc. Uh, fast scalable mobilization. So a number of participants globally can join in on a local event. So think in terms of, uh, let's say, a local protest against uh, uh, election results somewhere that can be joined uh, by a, a global uh, distributed network of participants or helped in one way or another. The main political currency is attention and the modulation of attention. And you can see here the role of the stacks because we established that the stacks valorize and weaponize, in fact, the attention of their users uh, uh, in order to, to leverage these predictive algorithms. And you can see here the role of the stacks of companies such as Google and Facebook, Apple, Amazon, in uh, in uh, uh, participating in uh, the, uh, the political discourse in the political space uh, of the network society. Uh, we have very fast polarization appearing as a natural effect here with, with uh, the, the, the effect of uh, large data aggregates, large user aggregates and uh, uh, in, in axiomatically emerging power law distribution. So fast polarization between opinions and aggregate behavioral patterns which are uh, always already predictable and uh, 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 which can be modulated uh, with the, the appropriate predictive algorithm. We also talked about collective intelligence in the context of uh, uh, the network society uh, uh, and politics and also in the context of meme warfare. So the, the key takeaway here and uh, again all of these tropes are useful when it comes to think, uh, our thinking about uh, the hacker subculture and the emergence of the hacker subculture from uh, the early internet and with the early internet in fact. So we have here also this, this phenomenon of fully distributed networks uh, uh, acting as swarms which are ad hoc distributed networks forming for a specific purpose and then dissolving equally quickly. Um, uh, the, the key takeaway here was this, this point uh, that I've made in, in uh, a piece I've published um, uh, that uh, uh, the distributed topology of, uh, of a swarm allows it to process information uh, uh, locally across its entire surface and react to them much faster to, uh, than a decentralized or centralized network for that matter with much lower time delay, right? Which makes this uh, these uh, uh, topologies much more adaptable, right? So uh, uh, swarms emerging as a political actor, swarms forming around an issue, uh, uh, can, can uh, have devastating, uh, devastating effects against centralized networks. Why? Because of the speed with which they adapt to a changing environment. 
So um, on global information networks, I, uh, ideal ecology for mean propagation because again, the homogenization of time and space, collective intelligence, the default form of participation of distributed networks, again, the formation of this kind of uh, issue-based or problem-based swarms. Um, uh, when a collective intelligence forms uh, in, a, in this kind of network environment, it's always acting as a self-coordinating swarm towards some sort of common goal. Um, and these swarms are characterized by very low transaction costs, which means that they, they have to uh, uh, pay next to nothing in terms of uh, uh, um, attention, and in terms of uh, uh, agency, and in terms of costs. Uh, to maintain themselves, and they have extremely fast information processing speeds, which of course leads us to the final uh, uh, important point that I want to raise when it comes to uh, uh, tropes, which is what we observe when it comes to meme warfare swarms. Uh, so we have the, the use of uh, social media for mobilization, coordination, and dissemination. They scale up very fast because anyone can contribute in any capacity globally. They are operating in an open process with very fast feedback loops so everyone can observe and see what everyone else is doing and learn from their mistakes or from their successes and copy them, replicate them across the entire network. This in turn uh, automatically, axiomatically in fact, leads to, to the next point which is that um, very quickly you have uh, a long tails developing in terms of attention because uh, an unsuccessful attack vector is identified so everyone automatically focuses on that uh, all content encountered uh, both content generated within the network and uh, adversarial content which is being attacked is treated as open source so it can be modulated at will so again information wants to be free here this this point made by Stuart Brandt long time ago um, is, is one of the key uh, if you will, uh, mimetic descriptors of uh, uh, the, the, the network society paradigm and uh, all the, these emergent phenomena that are generated by it. Uh, anonymity is of fundamental importance here. And we will return to this point again and again when it comes to our discussion of hacker culture. Why? Because uh, anonymity automatically results in very much lower network transaction costs because um, uh, the, the operators behind a specific attack or behind a specific uh, uh, swarm activity uh, do not have to maintain uh, identities, right? So the maintenance of identities is a cost that the network has to perform. And uh, the more pronounced the identities, the more social capital they have, the more uh, the actors behind them have to, uh, uh, the, the, the more cost they have to dedicate to maintain those identities, right? So anonymity results in a dramatic lowering of network transaction costs, therefore uh, increasing the speed of action of the network and uh, its efficiency. And finally, decisions are made through memetic replication, which is basically the, 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 that uh, ability of uh, this kind of distributed network to very quickly learn from mistakes and successes by literally replicating uh, uh, the appropriate actions across its uh, entire surface. All right, so uh, armed with this understanding, having that, uh, that, that mapping of the important tropes, we can now start our discussion of hacking. And our first port of call is a return to something we discussed in uh, one of the f uh, in, in the first lecture in this cycle in fact which is uh, the phenomenon of cryptanalysis which uh, came to fall and uh, came uh, into prominence um, in the uh, second world war um, the uh, context here is the appearance of uh, encryption machines and probably the most famous of those uh, from the beginning of the 20th century is the Enigma machine which was developed in Germany and uh, uh, became a, 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 you know, a very popular tool to encrypt, to occlude communication, right? So with the emergence of information networks and global information flows, you have obviously the emergent need to protect communication, to protect the contents 
of this global information flow. So you have uh, encryption coming to the fore. And uh, the Enigma machine was a really popular product uh, in the interwar period. So after the First World War uh, and in the 20s, especially the early 30s, so you have corporations using it, uh, you have government services using it, and then you have the German military using it, uh, using a more sophisticated, more complex version of the Enigma machine. So this is the context uh, into which cryptanalysis comes to the fore and the context in, uh, of, for the beginning of uh, the Second World War. You have this hidden battle before the official war starts in 1939 with the German invasion of Poland. You have the hidden battle between uh, cryptanalysis teams. On the one hand, the German teams uh, working on uh, uh, um, hardening the Enigma machine and hardening, protecting from penetration German communications. And then you have the reverse. Uh, uh, the, the, in, in this case, we have uh, uh, Poland and the future allies uh, uh, England, uh, the United States, uh, um, collaborating in cracking that Enigma machine. So this is, uh, uh, for our intents and purposes, this is literally the primordial, the originary myth for uh, hacking as a as a phenomenon. Right? This 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 battle for the opening up of the German communications for cracking of the Enigma machine, and. Uh, the Enigma machine was used extensively by the German military. So what's really important here to understand for our intents and purposes is that from the Allied perspective, the effort to crack uh, the Enigma machine was pretty much uh, the most important effort of the Second World War. Because once successful, and as you would see, it was successful very quickly, um, it allowed the Allies to see through German communications more often than not, uh, uh, Allied Central Command was able to see the orders uh, issuing from uh, Berlin to German commanders in the field earlier than German commanders themselves were able to decrypt them. Here you can see uh, General Heinz Guderian in France in May 1940 uh, with his team of uh, uh, Enigma operators either uh, encrypting or decrypting a message. The point is that having the ability to see uh, uh, German military communications, and we're talking here about uh, the, the uh, uh, German uh, Wehrmacht, so the, the, the German uh, army, the Kriegsmarine, which is the Navy and the Luftwaffe, the, the Air Force. So the Allies were able to uh, read through the communications of all of these uh, elements of the German, uh, armed, uh, German armed forces and uh, which in turn gave them predictive power. And again, if you've been paying attention so far, you would see how this links to our discussion of the stack and the, the value of uh, uh, algorithmic prediction. The ability to see uh, and aggregate uh, German communication uh, in the clear, right, to be able to decrypt it at speed and at scale in aggregate uh, allowed Allied command uh, the ability to predict German, German movements before uh, German generals in the field could actually know what their orders were. Right? So this is really important to understand when you're thinking about the Second World War. A lot of the information related to the Allied uh, cracking of the Enigma actually was only declassified in the early 1990s. Until that time, for the entirety of the 20th century, uh, people were unaware of that, and for good reason, because this was actually uh, how the war was won. And as it turns out, the war was won before it even started. Because uh, the Enigma was initially cracked by a Polish mathematician by the name of Marian Rajewski, who hacked the first uh, iteration of the Enigma. He managed to crack the mathematical code that was used for the, by the Enigma uh, encryption algorithm. So he was able to reverse the encryption, as it were, by, by deploying that same algorithm. Uh, and this, was, this happened in the mid-1930s. And this information was shared in 1939 with uh, the Allies. And by that time, the Germans had uh, sophisticated uh, the Enigma, had uh, made it more complex. But uh, the work of Rayevsky fell uh, or was given to, into the hands of uh, a brilliant mathematician and the father of uh, modern computing and artificial intelligence, Alan Turing, who 
1939, using Raevsky's work and his own uh, uh, brilliant uh, uh, analysis, managed to crack uh, the Enigma. And not only that, but he managed to, he, he designed a machine, no, he, which he called the Bombe, which basically automated the decryption of subsequent iterations of the Enigma. Right? So it allowed, in 19, it allowed uh, uh, the Allies, and in this case uh, uh, the United Kingdom, to, to automate the process of decrypting German communications uh, in real time at scale. And again, this is happening in 1939, before England or France, for that matter, were actually officially uh, in, in hot war with, uh, with Germany. And uh, this is how the Bombay looked like in uh, Bletchley Park, where the headquarters of uh, the British uh, cryptanalyst uh, uh, war effort were, where Alan Turing was working. So uh, this is the context. And the key trope here for us is this, this uh, 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 the, the importance of uh, accessing the flow of information and the importance of understanding how the algorithm works, the importance of cracking that algorithm. And these are, so this is the, the primordial hacking event, if you will, from the perspective of the internet. And then we move into the 1960s, where uh, something very interesting happens. So we have, uh, on, on, we started with uh, uh, the, the um, United Kingdom and the Allied war effort. So we have these massive centralized state bureaucracies working towards a common goal uh, with the resources of an empire, right, of a very powerful state. And here we have something radically different, diametrically opposite happening, uh, a fascinating phenomenon. So um, the story begins, and this is the story of, uh, of hacking as we know it today in earnest. It begins in the 1960s with the introduction of uh, electronic uh, phone network switchboards. If you recall, until that time, we've already talked about this several times, Switchboards were manual, right? They were analog, and uh, they were operated usually by by women. So these were the so-called telephone girls from uh, from uh, uh, we, we, which we already encountered in the end of the 19th, the early 20th century. So in the 1960s, these switchboards are automated and they are made electronic, and this leads to a very interesting exploit, which is literally the beginning of uh, the modern history of hacking, uh, known as phone freaking. So the exploit here uh, is, is has reached a mythical status. Uh, there are several different versions of the story. The most popular version of the story is related to uh, the character of uh, John Draper, who was known as Captain Crunch, uh, because he discovered that uh, uh, a whistle that was uh, uh, introduced with, uh, was sold, in fact, with uh, uh, the Captain Crunch cereals as a you know, marketing ploy to appeal to, to children. So he discovered that this whistle was releasing a tone uh, at uh, 2600 hertz. Uh, and this tone allowed him to, when, when played into, uh, uh, in, in a phone booth, uh, into the phone, into the receiver, uh, allowed him to uh, fool these uh, 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 the, the network switchboards that were uh, being introduced. So they were f he, he, using this tone, he was able to fool the switchboard that uh, this is a, a valid uh, uh, phone uh, operation, it's a, it's a valid signal. And uh, he was able basically to call uh, long distance or internationally for free because he was able to access directly the switchboard without payment. And uh, again, th there are several different versions of uh, uh, this story. There is another version that a friend of John Draper, who uh, uh, was uh, vision impaired, discovered this tone by whistling on his own the, uh, into the phone. The point is that uh, this was an accidental discovery and it started, that is, started a, a movement which uh, was a bottom-up organic movement of people exploiting uh, weakness in the uh, in a machine, in effect, by figuring out the algorithm and cracking that algorithm, the algorithm that operated the machine. And uh, as a result, you have this <clears throat> very interesting clash 
emerging already in the 1960s between uh, what is an ad hoc, uh, completely anarchic uh, uh, group of uh, people trying to exploit uh, a machine and a corporate system which is trying to plug these holes and chase and, 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 and capture the people exploiting them. And here you have the roots of, of modern hacking that we know, that, as we know. So uh, 2600 hertz tone, phone freaking, this is how the signal sounds. So this signal was generated and here you have an example of how uh, this worked in practice. You have uh, uh, John Draper, Captain Crunch, phone freaking with uh, uh, a little machine that uh, people called a blue box. Uh, this is in 1971. So you had this machine uh, that uh, was able to generate this tone. So once you generated that tone, you had access automatically to the switchboard and then uh, you were able to dial any phone number and reach literally any phone number on the planet uh, for free without without paying. So this was known as phone freaking. And uh, uh, fun fact, uh, the primary occupation of Steve Wozniak and uh, Steve Jobs before they founded Apple was to be phone freaks. And in fact, uh, here you have an example from the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney of uh, the a phone freaking blue box which was designed and built by Steve Wozniak and sold by Steve Jobs. So their primary business initially before founding Apple was to sell uh, 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 to these blue boxes to phone freaks and to hack uh, the uh, these, these switchboards themselves. And this is uh, one of the great ironies of uh, the, the beginnings of the internet, the, the titans of companies such as uh, uh, the, the founders, the titanic fa uh, founders of companies such as Apple um, uh, actually started their, their careers as, uh, as uh, these proto-hackers, right, as phone freaks, uh, only to, to reach a stage later on where their companies were uh, the primary uh, targets for future hackers, right? So um, the, the, f the roots of the internet are in this culture, in this subculture of the subculture of experimentation with machines, tinkering with machines, trying to hack into machines, trying to crack and understand uh, uh, black boxed uh, uh, algorithms and code, trying to gain access to information flows, right? So it's really important that you understand that because this is the these are the primary tropes that later on inform the decisions that uh, that built the internet as we know it today so following the phone freaking culture so it started in the 60s in the in the 70s it, it bloomed and it, it became uh, a really popular widespread phenomenon we have uh, the emergence of the first personal computers right and this is the time where everything speeds up tremendously the nodes begin processing Right. We've talked about this before, the first uh, uh, personal computers appearing in the early 80s with uh, the computer to really break the boundary of the home and to become popular as a home machine, as a computer that people would buy and bring home as opposed to something that they would encounter in the office was the Commodore 64 in 1982 and uh, this was also the first machine to be used by hackers extensively and it was known as like the cult hacker's choice machine the Commodore 64. Uh, simultaneously with that, we have the emergence of the modem, which allowed connecting of these computers into a network, into a fully distributed network. This is when the nodes begin connecting to each other, right? We talked about this as well. We have uh, the first uh, smart modem, the Hay smart model, emerging more or less at the same time as the first personal computers. And this uh, creates critical mass, right? So because uh, first tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people start connecting to each other uh, and talking, communicating with each other, exchanging information with each other, with each other outside of any corporate or government control. And this is really important to understand. This is where cyberspace is born. Right? This is literally the birth of the internet. Uh, it has nothing to do with universities. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, corporations, nothing to do with the state. Uh, a lot of the early history of the internet, if you read it now, uh, would uh, uh, embellish and emphasize the role of uh, the state, for example, the role of DARPA in funding 
uh, early internet research or the role of the uh, uh, different universities in making the first connections possible. But the point I'm making here is that uh, in and of themselves, these uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, universities uh, in the world working on the early internet or all of the governments investing in the early internet wouldn't have gone anywhere without the critical mass provided by ordinary users who uh, uh, didn't have anything in common. They didn't have any interfacing with uh, uh, corporations, universities or the state. They just wanted to talk to each other, right? And the internet is born not in universities, uh, 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 corporate boardrooms or in the state, but in these connections between ordinary users. And uh, the proof of concept here is the rise of the BBS, right? The bulletin board systems, which are not corporate, which are not university uh, based, which are not state controlled. They are uh, uh, controlled by random users on the nascent internet being born. And this is where cyberspace appears for the first time. We talked about this before as well. And bulletin board systems are of all sorts of different varieties. They usually involve uh, the sharing of information, the posting of information and uh, information exchange in general. This is the compost, uh, the, the cultural informational compost out of which the hacker subculture appears. And the hacker, it is the hacker subculture that actually drives uh, this, this development. Again, as a reminder, the characteristics of the, the nascent internet, right, characterized by uh, uh, the TCP IP protocol, right, which appeared in the 70s, is, uh, uh, you know, this anarchic uh, uh, architecture uh, built uh, uh, with primarily through improvisation. There's no central plan. There is no plan whatsoever. Uh, there's no centralized oversight. There are uh, all sorts of different uh, uh, architecture, all sorts of different communities connecting to each other. Um, all solutions to problems that emerge are ad hoc patches because no one knew that these process problems would emerge in the first place, right? So this is an entirely exploratory wild space, uh, not accidental. Again, we talked about this in the context of the emergent, the, the, our discussion of cyberspace, that this is a wild space that uh, was metaphorized as the Wild West, right? And the primary explorers of that Wild West of cyberspace, uh, the, the cowboys of that space, if you will, are the hackers. So the early 80s see the uh, emergence of hacker, the first hacker collectives, and these are the hacking pioneers. So the 414s, the Legion of Doom, Masters of Deception, and the Cult of the Dead Cow. Uh, the legendary hacker collectives, which uh, pre pretty much uh, uh, kickstarted the hacker subculture. And so they are, yeah, they are characterized by um, primarily hacking into phone switches, right? So building on uh, the phone freaking culture, which already existed at that time. So phone switches were the primary targets of attack in order to gain access to the network. Once one could gain access to the wider network, uh, the, the next target of attack were uh, the network control mainframes. Like, for example, we will talk down the track in this lecture about Julian Assange. Julian Assange started his career, not surprisingly, as a hacker in, in Victoria, in Australia. And uh, uh, his, his, uh, one of his big exploits as a hacker was to hack into the Nortel network control mainframe in Victoria, in Melbourne. So uh, this was the, 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 these are the mainframe computers which control uh, uh, wide area networks were the, the these were the next targets of attack and then finally we have uh, government servers being attacked and uh, and uh, uh, you know their, their defenses tested and cracked and, and information being accessed so uh, the important thing to understand here is that the rise of the internet as we know it today is inextricably related to the emergence of the hacker subculture. So this is not some sort of niche subculture that emerged as it were on the side of the internet. The internet would not be possible without the hacker subculture. Right? They emerged together. They are uh, inextricably linked, in undivisible. As long as there is an internet, as we know it, that original distributed network, as long as it exists, there will be a hacker subculture and vice versa, right? As long as there is a hacker subculture, there is some hope for the internet. 
it is the native culture of the internet it emerged together with the internet it is born together out of the same uh, uh, primary conditions that may make the internet and hackers of culture possible the modus operandi is uh, uh, completely anarchic uh, it's uh, uh, not accidental again because uh, it's uh, necessitated it's potentiated by the underlying architecture and the primary decisions made when it comes to the protocols and again we talked about tcp ip in this context and the insofar as there is any social capital and we will see initially identities were really important uh, only to reach uh, uh, where we are today in the 2020s where um, identities were completely abandoned for the sake of anonymity but initially when, uh, when identities were really important in the early uh, hackers of culture in the internet the early internet uh, sharing and reciprocity were the primary forms for social capital generation so uh, you, you would rise in recognition uh, insofar as uh, obviously you had uh, exploits as a hacker and uh, insofar as you shared those exploits, as you shared that knowledge with the wider community, right? As if, uh, insofar as you reciprocated someone giving you information with information on your own, right? So sharing of knowledge, sharing of information, reciprocity in terms of access to information were uh, fundamental value and uh, uh, needless to say this was also the greatest weakness of the hacker subculture because these collectives that I showed you earlier like the, the Legion of Doom, Masters of Deception, Cult of the Dead Cow uh, most if not all of their members ended up being apprehended by law enforcement uh, precisely because of that culture of sharing and reciprocity because uh, uh, they had to share their exploits they had to explain how they have done it to other members of the community so that they can get uh, that social capital and uh, of course this was the great weakness of the of the early hacker subculture so the recognition and bragging rights as, as i already said were, were based on uh, exploits and the sharing of that information and concomitantly with that we have the emergence of uh, a jargon which characterizes that subculture which can be very uh, uh, explicit and hard to penetrate the the pieces of the jargon that have sort of uh, 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 leaked into uh, popular internet jargon and have become basically uh, 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 part of the internet uh, language as such or uh, you know lead speak so we have pond and noob and wood and hacker uh, written in lead speak um, there are many such uh, examples the, the thing is that when you encounter these uh, these uh, 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 this, this pieces of internet jargon you need to understand where they come from they all come from uh, the early internet hackers of culture and the two uh, uh, originary and primary vehicles for the, uh, the, the, the uh, spread of this subculture were the two hacker zines of uh, the early 80s so this is the uh, 2600 and frac and uh, here is a, for an example how FRAC, uh, the first issue of FRAC actually positioned itself to, to uh, other hackers who might be interested. Um, so this is volume one, issue one. Uh, welcome to the FRAC files. Basically we are a group of file writers and again notice how file is written. This is part of the lead speak who have combined our files and are distributing them in a group. This is a newsletter. Uh, if you're interested in writing files, you, your group, your BBS or any other credits will be included. Look at the kind of information that uh, is interesting. Uh, articles on telecommunications, freaking or hacking, anarchy, guns and death and destruction, or cracking. And cracking here stands for the cracking of locked software, sharing uh, of, of uh, software which is uh, otherwise uh, uh, has some sort of copy pro protection. Uh, if you feel you have some materials that's original, please call and we'll include it in the next issue possible. So again, sharing and reciprocation. Um, here is an example of the uh, table of contents from uh, the FRAC magazine, uh, issue, uh, volume one, issue one. So we have uh, uh, an article on uh, uh, some security, uh, on boot tracing on Apple, phone freaks revenge, 
uh, international calling cards, how to pick master locks, how to make an acetylene bomb, uh, and school, college, computer dial-ups. So again, you can see the, the topics here and the kind of, we have a dallying and, and trading with uh, illicit knowledge, right? With information which is not supposed to be shared out of, uh, let's say, government or, or corporate uh, circles. Um, uh, another really important text in this context is uh, the first Hacker Manifesto, which was written by the mentor from the Legion of Doom in 1986 after his arrest. Uh, and as he opens it up, the following was written shortly after my arrest. Uh, and the initial text, the, the original title is The Conscience of a Hacker, but this very quickly became known as the Hacker Manifesto. So let's read through it. It's really worthwhile going through this. So again, this is the mid-80s. The personal computer has only been on the market for four years. Another one got caught today. It's all over the papers. Teenager arrested in computer crime scandal. Hacker arrested after bank tampering. Damn kids, they are all alike. But did you, in your three-piece psychology and 1950s techno brain, ever take a look behind the eyes of the hacker? Did you ever wonder what made him tick, what forces shaped him, what may have molded him? I am a hacker, enter my world. Mine is a world that begins with school. I'm smarter than most of the other kids. This crap they teach us bores me. Damn underachiever, they are all alike. I'm in junior high or high school. I've listened to teachers explain for the 15th time how to reduce a fraction. I understand it. No, Miss Smith, I did not show my work. I did it in my head. Then kid probably copied it. They are all alike. I made a discovery today. I found a computer. Wait a second, this is cool. It does what I wanted to. If it makes a mistake, it's because I screwed it up. Not because it doesn't like me. Or feels threatened by me or thinks I'm a smart ass. Or doesn't like teaching and shouldn't be here. Then kid, all he does is play games. They are all alike. So you can see a trope emerging here, right? So we have a total rejection of a system, right? And personified here by the institution of the school. And you have this tension, this drama between the institution and the individual. And we'll see a return to this again and again down the track. And you have this crystallized here. Uh, the other important trope is they are all alike. And we will return to this very forcefully down the track in a second. And then it happened. A door opened to a world, rushing through the phone like uh, through the phone line like heroin through an addict's veins. An electronic pulse is sent out. A refuge from the day-to-day -day incompetence is sought. A board is found. So he's talking about bulletin board system here. But notice how uh, how how similar this this this. Uh, uh, insight here from the mentor is to uh, Holtern describing uh, the telegraph in the, the mid 19th century. How similar this is to that trope of the release from the boundaries of the material, right? And the, the, um, the, the access to the ocean of information. This is it. This is where I belong. I know everyone here, even if I've never met them, never talked to them, may never hear from them again. I know you all. Then kid, tying up the phone line again, they're all alike. You bet your ass we're all alike. We've been spoon-fed baby food at school when we hungered for steak. The bits of meat that you did let slip through were pre-chewed and tasteless. We've been dominated by sadists or ignored by the apathetic. And this is really, again, we have a total condemnation of, of uh, uh, institutionalized knowledge. Uh, and you could, he could probably say the same thing about the university as well. It's a total uh, uh, rejection of institutions uh, for the sake of the freedom of the individual. And finally, this is our world now, the world of the electron and the switch, the beauty of the bold. We make use of a service already existing without paying for what could be dirt cheap if it wasn't run by profiteering gluttons and you call us criminals. We explore and you call us criminals. We seek after knowledge and you call us criminals. We exist without skin color, without nationality, religious bias, and you call us criminals. Yes, I'm a criminal. My crime is that of curiosity. My crime is that of judging people by what they say and think, not what they look like. 
My crime is that of outsmarting you, something that you will never forgive me for. I'm a hacker and this is my manifesto. You may stop this individual, but you can't stop us all. After all, we are all alike. And this is a really powerful statement here about the, if you will, a, a kind of metaphorical dive into the anonymity of the masses, which are always on the other side of the battle against institutions, against states, governments, uh, uh, corporations, and all sorts of bureaucratized institutions. We are, after all, we are all alike, right? So and you have, you may stop this individual, but you can't stop us all. So this is really powerful, and we will see a return to this down the track with uh, the further evolution of uh, different hacker subcultures. We explore, we seek after knowledge, so we have the, this, the valorization of information and access to knowledge. Uh, we exist without skin color, without nationality, without religious bias. We have a, a total rejection of institutionalized identities. And you can't stop us all after all we are all alike. So what happens is that this hacker subculture uh, very quickly spreads like wildfire. And this spread is... Uh, simultaneous with the spread of the personal computer and the modern right so it, that, this is the, uh, in the 80s and in the early 90s up until somewhere i would say until the mid 90s when the internet suddenly became popular with corporations and be, started becoming corporatized uh, the access to the internet automatically uh, hit that mystery and that that mystique of an access to a wild west uh, populated by people who are willing to share information and who are willing to uh, to do a lot to access information um, and, and and it access to a very anarchic space so uh, that that nascent subculture the hacking subculture is also the the nascent internet subculture so uh, media starts engaging with it. And we have the first film to actually engage with uh, hacking as a subculture was uh, War Games from 1982. Uh, and the, the plot of the film is, uh, again, not, uh, not surprisingly at all, featuring a, a teenager who hacks, hacks into uh, computer networks, ends up hacking into the Pentagon and uh, primary mainframe computer of the Pentagon. So um, it's a really fascinating insight into that, that time. It's really worth watching. And so we have this period from the early 1980s to the early 2000s where sort of the story uh, is <clears throat> closed with uh, um, the Matrix uh, Reloaded in 2003 where Nmap appears for the first time on film and Nmap is a really powerful uh, network mapping software which is used by hackers uh, everywhere to identify open ports, to exploit open ports and gain access to <clears throat> the network. So here we have, uh, as an example, Trinity in uh, in the movie accessing a nuclear power station's uh, uh, internal network by loading and map uh, on her computer and finding a port. In this case, she found uh, uh, the port 22 is running over TCP and, and it's open. And so she used the uh, um, you know she used and map to uh, overwrite uh, the the root password and, uh, and gain access to the network and then perform uh, a shutdown. So um, this, this pretty much gives us a, a, an example of how the level at which hacker culture uh, managed to exploit also and, and penetrate, uh, uh, let's, let's call it uh, uh, popular culture. And, uh, um, and this is entirely a result of, of the spread of the internet, the popularization of the internet. So again, this is uh, entirely an emergent phenomenon of the, the primary characteristics of the network as it was designed, of the topology. It's a, a, a network which was designed uh, in an anarchic way through improvisation. All solutions were ad hoc patches. So what we have emerging here as uh, key tropes of uh, the hacker subculture is uh, the, the uh, importance of anonymity. <clears throat> hiding behind pseudonyms or outright remaining anonymous. And again, as the mentor from the Legion of Doom pointed out, after all, we are all alike. Right? And we will return to this with uh, the anonymous movement. 
Um, the mode of operations is always already anarchic, right, without any sort of centralized uh, coordination, no centralized voice identity or oversight. Uh, participation is to be presumed always already global because the information network itself is global. Uh, the primary value, the unit of value here is information and it's knowledge. And again, the information wants to be free, trope is really powerfully visible here. Um, all exploits are ad hoc discoveries, so they are often completely accidental, like the Captain Crunch example and the beginning of phone freaking is an, is an excellent illustration of that. Uh, so these are ad hoc accidental exploit discoveries which end up being spread widely because the social capital uh, of the network is and of the, the hacker subculture is based on sharing and reciprocity right so in this regard uh, it, the, the, the hacking subculture is always already very similar to what we now would call the meme warfare subculture and we will return to this down the track in the lecture where uh, mimetic replication uh, is, is the primary mode in which the network understands what is the, the swarm understands what it is doing and again it's all based on sharing and reciprocity okay so we've uh, very briefly because this is a, a, a massive topic deserving its own a series of lectures we've very briefly described uh, the, the birth of the hacker subculture and now let's look at some examples of hacktivism which is uh, nothing more nothing less but the uh, um, the blending in of hacking and the ethos of hacking, the, the ethos of the hackers of culture with uh, social and political activism. And uh, if you've been paying attention, you would uh, realize that this is always already a predictable development because the, the main battle space in the network society paradigm is people's minds. And uh, uh, Apart from that, the, uh, what's really interesting to observe is the, the choices, the political choices taken uh, by uh, the hackers of culture um, and the way the, they resonate with the, the, these primary tropes when it comes to the hackers of culture. So uh, they're informed by the net, this, these tropes of uh, the natural society as a political space, which we already discussed. Uh, this notion of decentralized operations and uh, being unrestrained by borders operating globally, fast mobilization, uh, and attention is the main currency. Uh, and here we have we have a lot of overlap already with uh, hacking subculture, and uh, the the results of those overlap are not uh, not long to uh, appear. So we have uh, already in the 90s the emergence of uh, um, a collective called the Electronic uh, Disturbance Theater. So they popularized uh, uh, something that they called Electronic Civil Disobedience ECD, which involved uh, attacks against uh, uh, websites which uh, you know were presumed to be engaged in, in uh, uh, something unjust. So, for example, um, the, the classic example here is the development by the electronic disturbance theater of uh, Floodnet, which was a piece of software that allowed uh, globally distributed users to participate in um, uh, distributed denial of service attacks against uh, uh, what were perceived as legitimate targets, in this case the, the Mexican government, which was uh, oppressing the Zapatista movement in, uh, in Mexico. And, uh, uh, what distributed denial of service attacks are is nothing more, nothing less, but you know, tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands, of millions of, millions of users uh, simultaneously or over a very short period of time trying to access a single um, website, a single internet address, which overwhelms the systems and, and, and shuts, shuts the system down, shuts down the website. Um, so this is uh, the simplest possible form of uh, electronic civil disobedience according to the uh, electronic disturbance theater was this sort of uh, uh, DDoS. Uh, another type of DDoS more advanced was uh, in, in, uh, involving the defacing of websites or so getting access to the, the target websites and defacing them with, uh, with, for example, a political message of performing what they called cyber sit-ins where people would periodically do a DDoS against a website, shutting it down 
uh, acting in a similar manner to what people would do on the street, let's say, if they go and do a sitting in front of a government building or in front of a corporate office in order to shut it down. Another example comes from uh, the uh, two collectives, the Hacktivismo and the Cult of the Dead Cow. So this example is already, uh, uh, it's, it's already gone, but uh, it, it's a really interesting uh, example of uh, this sort of hacktivist collaboration. This is from the early 2000s. Uh, uh, so as, I, as I said again, this is the, uh, uh, an established hacking collective, Cult of the Dead Cow, producing an uh, anonymous browser which they called Tor Park, or later it became known as the XB browser, which allowed uh, users to uh, browse uh, uh, anonymously away from corporate and government uh, surveillance and censorship. And we reached the probably the best example of hacktivism, which is still uh, ongoing, uh, which is obviously Wikileaks and Wikileaks started in 2006 and it was started by Julian Assange. Uh, Julian Assange uh, uh, is uh, an Australian citizen uh, who uh, grew up uh, uh, in various places in Australia. He was a hacker in his youth, uh, like, as I already mentioned. He's uh, 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 um, you know, one of his uh, early exploits was to hack into the Nortel uh, network switchboard in Melbourne and gain control of it. So uh, he was really talented, he, really talented uh, uh, hacker, really talented uh, um, uh, coder. And uh, so he started Wikileaks in 2006 and he started it with a very specific purpose. And his purpose was to reveal information, right? His purpose was to give the populace, right, the masses, the people uh, who are all alike, um, access to to secrets that uh, that were, were, have been hidden from them, access to information that uh, would allow them to see the world as it is, would allow them to understand how their governments operate or how corporations operate, and. So the way he describes Wikileaks is not as an organization, but as a media insurgency, right? So um, Wikileaks started and to this day is operating entirely according to the ethos of uh, the early hacker subculture. Uh, it's, it's operating as an exercise in information transparency. Um, and uh, it, there's this great interview that uh, Julian Assange did with uh, The New Yorker in 2010 and here you're seeing an excerpt from, from that interview uh, it's titled No Secrets Julian Assange's Mission for Total Transparency and uh, uh, in it he spells quite clearly uh, his ethos as, a, as, as, as uh, the founder of Wikileaks and his ethos as when, when uh, he was a hacker um, don't damage computer systems you break into, including crashing them. Don't change the information in those systems, except for altering locks covering to cover your tracks and share information. And again, uh, information sharing and reciprocation, the primary value proposition when it comes to the hackers of culture. Right? This is how social capital uh, is built. And furthermore, the defining Human struggle, uh, according to Assange, is not left versus right or fate versus reason, but individual versus institution. And here we reach that point, which was already mapped quite clearly by the mentor uh, from the Legion of Doom in his manifesto from 1986. Uh, it's all about this clash between uh, the, the individual and uh, uh, institutionalized oppression. And this, this clash is always already about freedom the freedom of the individual. Uh, and information has a primary role here because information is the primary unit of value in the network society, right? So uh, it is the primary source of power. Hence, uh, the logic here informing uh, um, Assange's thinking and forming the, uh, the, 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 the foundation of uh, Wikileaks is this, this, this locus of power, giving people access to information, according to Assange. Uh, helps the individual in their battle against institutions because it gives uh, the individual power. 
And access to information gives access to power. And uh, Assange explains it further uh, very well in his uh, uh, interview. And this was actually a secret meeting uh, that he had uh, when he was uh, already uh, in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. A secret meeting that he had with uh, the then Google CEO Eric Schmidt. Um, and this is a fascinating, uh, fast, fascinating uh, uh, conversation. Uh, I highly recommend all of you uh, follow the link that I've uh, included on the screen and, and uh, read the conversation in its, in its entirety or listen to it because the recording is also attached on the WikiLeaks website. Uh, but he explains quite clearly uh, the, the logic behind uh, the way WikiLeaks has positioned itself and uh, the, the way it operates when it comes to giving access to information. But he also explains quite clearly uh, the, the necessity for anonymity. And he, he uses this example of, this, of the censorship pyramid, um, where on top you have uh, uh, you know, the, the extreme cases of, of uh, censorship against people sharing information. In this case, you know, journalists of various types. So we have murders of journalists and publishers. Then the next level, is political, uh, outright political attacks on journalists and publishers um, uh, in, involving some sort of delayed use of coercive force. And finally, we have uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, environment being built in which the sharing of information is actively discouraged, uh, where self-censorship is performed as, as regularly as that is the natural impulse, if you will. Uh, and, and the way he frames it, in this kind of environment, there are very few people who are murdered, there are uh, few people who suffer legal consequences, um, uh, but uh, this tremendous amount of self-censorship, and this self-censorship occurs in part because people don't want to move up into the upper parts of the pyramid, right, where they can be physically attacked uh, because they've shared information publicly. They've made information available to the public. Again, in the network society paradigm, information is power, right? So sharing of information is literally an act of giving power to the people who, who are given access to information. Um, so at the end of all of this, uh, the way he, he explains WikiLeaks, we took the position that we would need to have a publishing system whose only defense was anonymity, right? So. Assange takes the public role in order to act as a lightning rod for all possible attacks against Wikileaks, while the contributors, the people who actually give the information to Wikileaks, remain anonymous and protected from censorship. Right? And here we have this, again, the emergence of anonymity as a primary value. Um, and finally, another interesting thing that Assange says, which kind of fits very well with uh, the tropes we already uh, discovered in the emergence of uh, the hackers of culture, uh, if it is true information, we don't care where it comes from. Let people fight with the truth, and when the bodies are cleared, there will be bullets of truth everywhere. That's fine. So, is this notion of the bullets of truth everywhere, right? Information having the same effect as a bullet, allowing, uh, allowing people to see, to understand, right? Giving people power. So, um, there are a number of examples of uh, the, the so-called bullets of truth that were generated by, by Wikileaks. So here we have uh, probably the most famous, the, the, the example that shot them to notoriety with legacy media and with government, because legacy media have always already been uh, either a metaphoric or direct uh, uh, enemies of uh, uh, Wikileaks for, for obvious reasons, because this is uh, uh, non-institutional uh, uh, operator, non-institutional agent, uh, an agent coming from uh, uh, native to the internet as opposed to legacy media. So the classic example here is the, the collateral murder video, which you can uh, view and follow uh, and read the context of uh, on this link, uh, which uh, shot them to stardom and to notoriety, uh, which uh, describes uh, uh, the killing of, uh, of uh, uh, people in uh, uh, Iraq and shows footage of that. Um, then uh, uh, another powerful example here, which we've encountered already before um, in our conversation of, uh, about uh, social media revolutions, is the Wikileaks cables, 
uh, which uh, is uh, a gigantic treasure trove of documents that were leaked by anonymous sources in the US government. So these are um, diplomatic cables, uh, hundreds of thousands of emails and documents. Uh, with the main uh, of, of main relevance is the treasure trove that of documents that was released uh, uh, for the period of 2003 to 2010. But then there are other uh, um, you know databases of uh, documents all which were also released through uh, the through uh, WikiLeaks, which can be accessed on this website. So the WikiLeaks cables were really important because they allowed people to see the uh, if if you will the the, uh, uh, the kitchen where powerful uh, and important political decisions were being made, uh, allowed people to see uh, and gain a lot of insight about the operation of uh, governments along the, around the globe, as described in US diplomatic cables. Uh, again, I highly recommend uh, everyone uh, engages with those. Finally, um, the, the entirety of uh, uh, the WikiLeaks website is a treasure trove of information about uh, uh, all sorts of uh, government activities, corporate activities, which uh, uh, were always already uh, designed to operate uh, hidden behind the scenes, occluded from, uh, um, from the public. Um, and again, the WikiLeaks performs here this act of releasing information as uh, uh, an equivalence to, to giving people power. All right, so uh, we have WikiLeaks as an example of hacktivism. Another uh, famous or infamous, depending how uh, you want to look at it, example is the Anonymous Movement, which started in 2003, slightly before WikiLeaks. And uh, uh, one could say it exists to this day simply because this is uh, a movement without any sort of formal organization or any sort of uh, formal identity, apart from the identity of being anonymous. Um, it started on 4chan uh, on, and we already encountered the 4chan board as the birth uh, place of organized uh, uh, or rather uh, uh, anarchic uh, meme warfare operations. Um, Anonymous started on 4chan because of the anonymity of the platform and this is the, the, uh, the building block of 4chan as a platform is the anonymity of its users. and. Uh, Anonymous, uh, not surprisingly, started there. It's a collective intelligence, again, anarchic mode of operations. It's a global by definition and it has uh, uh, too many to count uh, uh, operations uh, to, to be used as examples uh, involving global participation. Uh, the primary value when it comes to the Anonymous movement and the primary vector of operations is freedom of information. Right? Giving access to knowledge, to the masses, to people. Uh, and again, this place resonates with the information wants to be free, dictum, and with the hacker subculture. Again, I'm trying to demonstrate uh, the way in which the hacker subculture, the early hacker subculture from the uh, 1980s, uh, influences the present with the emergence and the proliferation of these kind of movements. There is no centralized voice or any identity or any oversight. Uh, uh, as far as we know, when it comes to the anonymous movement, uh, like, hence, again, anonymous is its own identity. Uh, uh, there are, there are uh, a limited number of uh, memes associated with it. So here you have one, knowledge is free, we are anonymous, we are legion, we do not forgive, we do not forget, expect us. And again, we have, we are anonymous, we are legion. Knowledge is free should be obvious. Notice how this resonates with the Hacker Manifesto. We, uh, after all, we are all alike. We, you can't stop us all. We are anonymous. We are legion. Again, so we have the same tropes re-emerging again and again, right? Starting with the the, uh, the, the, the originary uh, mythos of uh, uh, the founding subculture of the internet. Uh, there is a, a very nice documentary that I recommend uh, uh, everyone watch when it comes to the anonymous movement. Uh, uh, it's called We Are Legion. And uh, uh, out of its multiplicity of uh, uh, operations, one that is really useful uh, to, to consider is uh, Operation Payback from 2010, which involved, again, in the spirit of the electron Electronic Disturbance Theater um, from the 90s, uh, distributed denial of service attack from uh, uh, 
global participants uh, on multiple targets and it's, the operation started in the context of uh, corporate censorship and uh, intellectual property rights enforcement. So it started against targets uh, in, uh, in the United States, then spread to uh, Asia and then to Europe. Um, and then it returned back to uh, United States uh, state targets um, and it was uh, then it, it mutated into a, a operation uh, as a, a revenge against uh, uh, censorship against uh, uh, WikiLeaks. So uh, it, it's an example of this kind of ad hoc anarchic uh, swarm based operation and it used software which uh, is kind of from the same uh, 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 originary uh, trope uh, as, uh, if you recall, the uh, electronic disturbance theater using Floodnet to, to generate distributed denial of service attacks. Um, uh, the anonymous uh, movement used uh, uh, what they called low orbit ion cannon, LOIC uh, software, which is an open source software that anyone could download from GitHub. And uh, all, the, all you needed to do was to download the software to input a URL uh, and a specific or a specific uh, IP address and then just, just to keep uh, uh, attacking it. So what, what happens is that the software would bombard that specific uh, internet address with uh, uh, queries which gives the effect of a distributed denial of service attack, especially when uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people perform it within a, a limited time period. Um, yet another example of uh, hacktivism in practice was uh, uh, LulzSec, uh, which is a really interesting uh, uh, cultural phenomenon because uh, it operated for a very brief period of time. LulzSec basically appeared in May 2011 and uh, folded uh, uh, in June 2011, but in that very short period of time managed to wreak uh, uh, havoc uh, in uh, with, with uh, uh, US government websites, uh, uh, CIA, the CIA's website, uh, and uh, uh, the number of, a number of uh, corporate websites. Um, and again, uh, LAUSEC was formed as a uh, uh, hacktivist group which was hacking not for money, but as they described it, for LAUS and to defend our internet ocean. And again, the idea here is that uh, these are like vigilante groups defending the freedom of information, protecting others who defend freedom of information and punishing those who uh, uh, encroach uh, on, on the freedom of information, so corporate uh, uh, institutionalized uh, interest. So the interesting thing when it comes to LASEC is that in, they, they all got arrested uh, uh, in, in that same year and uh, 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 serving lengthy sentences because one of them was uh, uh, um, revealed basically because of bragging and sharing information was revealed to the FBI and then was used by the FBI to to arrest everyone else and the group was uh, based in the United States and in uh, uh, England so uh, uh, what's interesting about LAWSEC is again this use of uh, 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 cultural elements from the hacker subculture such as you know laws making fun of uh, things making fun of institutions while at the same time, uh, um, you know, the, the prioritizing, valorizing the freedom of information. So uh, they were even using uh, this kind of ASCII-based art uh, to, to advertise their attacks on, uh, on government and corporate websites. Yet another example of uh, hacktivism in practice is uh, um, the whistleblowing of people such as uh, uh, Edward Snowden who released in 2013 a treasure trove of documents uh, uh, pertaining to the uh, NSA um, and uh, to a number of uh, other uh, three-letter agencies from uh, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, Australia, New Zealand and Canada. And uh, uh, the, the story of Edward Snowden is uh, too large to tell in a, in a lecture and uh, it's out of the scope of this lecture. But what's important for, for our purposes is that uh, as Bruce Sterling would describe the story in, in his uh, great piece on Snowden called the Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian Library, um, it's incredible to me that among the eight zillion civil society groups on the planet that hate and fear spooks and police spies, 
not one of them could offer Snowden one shred of pr practical help except for WikiLeaks. The, this valiant service came from Julian Assange, a dude who can't even pack his own suitcase without having a fit. The, the, the interesting thing here is that um, uh, Snowden was truly was helped by WikiLeaks to, uh, to get uh, uh, away from uh, uh, persecution and uh, to, he, he's to this day living somewhere in Russia uh, as a whistleblower. Um, but uh, what's really interesting here is that, uh, again, you have this uh, example of the, the early hackers of culture appearing again and again, um, and the ethos of uh, access to information uh, being equated with access to power. And the uh, uh, primary value here of giving access to, to the hidden secrets of the powerful. Um, as Bruce Sterling describes it, uh, uh, in the context of uh, a picture with this picture here uh, of Richard Stallman uh, and Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian uh, embassy where Assange is hiding from persecution, or was hiding. Uh, he eventually uh, was, was uh, uh, arrested. The British police entered the embassy and arrested him, um, uh, holding a picture of uh, um, Edward Snowden. Um, What's really interesting here is uh, that the, the way Sterling describes it, that these are fantastic figures like the promise of otherworldly aid from a superhero comic. They are visibly stronger than they've ever been before. They have the initiative in a world afflicted with comprehensive helplessness and there is more coming, lots, lots more. Um, and this is a really important point because um, uh, this, the, the point that uh, uh, Sterling is making and the point that I, I want to illustrate in this lecture is that the, the appearance of such figures as Assange or Snowden or movements such as Anonymous and uh, Lausek is uh, the organic, uh, the, an organic process uh, concomitant with, with uh, the internet. Right? So as long as the internet lives and it exists, you would have the appearance of these kind of figures um, who are, uh, are born out of uh, uh, the, uh, the native ethos of the internet. As I pointed out in the beginning, there won't be an internet without the hackers of culture. Right? And everything you know as the internet exists thanks to that subculture. So uh, insofar as the internet exists, it will keep renewing itself. It's the native subculture of this space. Um, all right, so let's uh, uh, sum up everything we've discovered. We have a subculture which uh, starts prioritizing anonymity, uh, working behind a pseudonym. Uh, it has an anarchic mode of operations, uh, a complete absence of centralized uh, coordination, no central voice, identity or oversight. It is always already global ignores all possible institutionalized identities, obviously. It's knowledge, uh, for, for it, knowledge is the primary value. Um, it uh, discovers exploits and its discoveries, its, its successes are always already ad hoc and always already shared and reciprocated, spreading across the network. And if you've been paying attention, you will notice how similar this is to the, uh, the uh, characteristics of meme warfare swarms we described and this is not accidental I'm making making this point on purpose in order to illustrate how this uh, uh, obviously hackers of culture predates by decades the appearance of uh, meme warfare swarms but the point is that meme warfare swarms replicate the key characteristics of hackers of cultures right so we have anonymity uh, all content is open source all decisions are made through mimetic replication sharing uh, open process um, it's global and uh, uh, anyone can contribute in any capacity, right? So uh, that's it from me for uh, this lecture. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, reach me out on, uh, uh, at, on Twitter at uh, Ted Mitchell. Uh, thank you all for listening and see you online.